Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. But the talk today and next week is not about New York, but the United States and its place in the world. Sunday night, May 1st, President Obama announced that Osama bin Laden had been killed by U.S. forces. There was joy, sadness, tears, and cheers, satisfaction and sorrow, relief and fear. It is complicated. One of those moments that lodges in one's mind. What does bin Laden's death mean? What are its effects on American foreign policy and domestic politics? Is it the end of the war on terror? Does it, should it mean getting out of Afghanistan? What to do with Pakistan? Is it a turning point or a breathing space? To address these and other questions about a post-Bin Laden world is Peter Beinert. He's an associate professor of journalism and political science at CUNY, a colleague of mine at the Graduate School of Journalism. He is senior political writer at the Daily Beast and a contributor to Time magazine. He is also senior fellow at the New America Foundation. From 1999 to 2006, Peter served as the editor of The New Republic. His most recent book is The Icarus Syndrome, How American Triumph Produces American Tragedy, a history of American hubris over the last century. I have read and sometimes argued with this and with his earlier book, The Good Fight. And we talk about the world today, post Bin Laden. Welcome, Peter. It's a real pleasure. I've known you for years. It's a pleasure meeting you in person. Before we get to history and Icarus, let's go to the headlines. The Obama killing. We've got, got him, said the New York Post. Rotten hell, said the Daily News. The Times a little more sober. Bin Laden killed by U.S. forces in Pakistan. Obama says declaring justice has been done. Your immediate reaction when you first heard it, what was your first, the first thing? A sense of relief, uh, a sense of um, satisfaction, um, and also a feeling that this year, uh, 2011, I think will really go down as the era, as the year when, 10 years after 9-11, we moved beyond the war on terror. Talk about that. You've, you've written uh, 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 blog postings and postings in the Daily Beast on May 2nd. The war on terror is over. What do you mean the war on terror is over? I don't mean there's no terrorist threat. Al-Qaeda still exists. We still have to do homeland security and law enforcement cooperation. But the war on terror suggested a centrality to American foreign policy, that this was the biggest concern that America had. Remember, George W. Bush very often said, this was our equivalent of World War II and the Cold War. I think the confluence of not just bin Laden's death, but the, the revolutions that are taking place in the Arab world, which shows that al-Qaeda is being completely passed by, that there are profound changes taking place in the Middle East, and very few of the people making those changes have any interest in al-Qaeda's ideology, suggests, in fact, that we are moving into an era in which we don't have to see this as, as central as we have. But at the same time, as al-Qaeda is losing its influence, the United States, in many ways, as shown through these the, this Arab Spring revolutions is really a peripheral player, both in terms of the, the Arab nations themselves, but also in terms of Europe, for example, in the Libyan situation. Talk about America and American power 2011. That's right. That's the great challenge for us, is that we went through a post-Cold War period in which we have a unipolar era. And now there is a decline in U.S. power. We'll probably still be the most powerful country in the world for quite a long time, but the margin has shrunk. And fundamentally, it's, been, it's because of the weakness of the American economy and the American economic model. And I think that's essentially, that's the central challenge for American power today, rebuilding the, the strength of the American economic model. So when you say the war on terror is over, you don't mean that there's no threat of a jihadist attack. What you're essentially saying is that it provided a lens to see the world and an opposed to order on the world, and that lens, in a sense, is shattered. What replaces it? What other lens do we wear? I think that the greatest threat to the United States 
is, is in fact the success of a series of other countries that, whose economies are rising fast and are challenging us in a whole series of ways. They're challenging our infrastructure, they're challenging us in for uh, control of natural resources, uh, and they are challenging our standard of living. And that, it seems to me, that economic challenge from China, from India, from Brazil, that is the central challenge of our time for the United States. So you're, you're suggesting that we, we redirect where we gaze rather than in foreign affairs, even though we have to be cognizant of that, that to turn America's can do exceptionalism internally. Yes, because ultimately the America's power overseas rests on the strength of our economic foundation uh, at home. And I think what you saw in the Bush era was that our military footprint grew and grew and grew, but the economic engine that was undergirding it was actually growing weaker. That's unsustainable. For America to remain powerful around the world, fundamentally what we need to do is deal with our debt at home and deal with our weakening infrastructure. Okay, so let, let, let's, let's move out again. Oh, uh, Osama bin Laden's dead. Does that really destroy the rationale for our involvement in Afghanistan? What does that death portend for Afghanistan, or what should it portend? I, I think it was already clear, but this makes it even clear that what we are doing in Afghanistan is fighting what is a very odious but mostly nationalist movement or kind of tribal movement in the South, Pashtun-based uh, uh, Taliban, and essentially trying to build a kind of nation and a, a state in, in Afghanistan that would be able to resist the Taliban. Now, morally, there may be some value to that. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the prospect of Taliban rule over large chunks of Afghanistan would be a horrible prospect. But if you look at it simply from the question of American national security, I think particularly with the weakening of al-Qaeda, it's very hard to make a case that this is the best use of billions or tens of billions of dollars uh, by the United States, given the crushing debt problems we have. And I think, actually, bin Laden's death gives Obama an opportunity to start to move, along with Petraeus' move, out of CENTCOM to the CIA to move towards withdrawal in Afghanistan. Talk about Petraeus and his role. Petraeus was central to the surge in Afghanistan, and then now he is CIA director. What role does he play in all of this, and what does he think? Well, Petraeus is the architect of this remarkable counterinsurgency movement in the U.S. military, which started in Iraq. And it is a testament to the extraordinary tenacity and creativity of the American military. They were given this very difficult job in Iraq and now in Afghanistan, and they've come up with this counterinsurgency doctrine to try to do it. The problem is it bears no realistic relationship to the larger realities of American power today, which is a counterinsurgency requires endless commitments of money and time, which the United States today simply does not have. And that's why I think, essentially, we need to discouple what we're doing in Afghanistan from that doctrine. But what you're describing, though, is symptomatic of Amer the American public's reaction to long-sustained counterinsurgencies. You go back to, to Vietnam, and you saw it then, that disillusion, et cetera, et cetera. And it takes, I mean, where it's successful, like in Malaysia, for example, it takes decades. You argue in, in several of the pieces that the American people don't have the stomach for, maybe that's too pejorative a way to put it, the stomach for long, involved engagements that involve the loss of American life. Americans are unwilling to sacrifice their sons and daughters. Admirable. Uh, unless, they, unless they see a direct threat the United States. Uh, and that's why I think that the, the, the support for Afghanistan is going to continue to decline, because fewer and fewer Americans really believe that completely vanquishing the Taliban is, is necessary for Americans to be safe. What Americans are seeing is their lives are being undermined in a whole series of other ways that have really nothing to do with what's going on in Afghanistan. And the only way we've been able to sustain this war, really, for such a long time, is the fact that because we now have an all-volunteer military, most Americans are not personally touched by it. If we had a draft like we had in the early years of Vietnam, the country would have exploded over this long time ago. So Charlie Rangel was right. I think Charlie Rangel was right. In fact, that, that it was the, a civilian, an all-volunteer military allows you to, to, be, to do expeditionary military uh, uh, kind of uh, adventures in a way that a, that a draft military doesn't. And I think that has actually not served the U.S. well because we can't actually afford these things.
And and so so the the professional military gives the government a, a lot of slack, if you will, within which to operate. And the American people allow this because of their disinterest and their disengagement. That's right. I mean, what's amazing is, is to to watch any of the cable news channels, you know, on the right, the Fox or the left, MSNBC, is you would barely know that America is at war in Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, the country is completely turned inward, and yet we have this small group of Americans who are paying this extraordinary sacrifice to be fighting these wars. And I think it's it's a it's a disturbing and uncomfortable situation. Okay, let's let's let, let's move uh, east, I guess, to Pakistan. The Pakistanis are under assault in the Congress. There are widespread questions about either incompetence and certainly more and more complicity in this. What should the United what is the United States doing vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan and what ought it be doing? Well, you know, we've been trying to get Pakistan to help us in this anti-terror effort, and they have both helped us and played the other side. We've been trying to get them to help us uh, in fighting the Taliban, and they've both helped us, but in reality, probably more helped the Taliban. There are certain problems that America cannot solve, right? I mean, many of our pro solving our problems here are difficult enough. We cannot solve the problem of Pakistan. Uh, it is way beyond our capacity. Are there frightening things in Pakistan? Absolutely, there are frightening things. But like I think, nuclear weapons, like like nuclear weapons, like like closeness to terrorist groups. But I think we have to have a certain modesty about what the U.S. can really accomplish, and we have to put it in the realistic framework of what is the real threat to the United States from terrorism coming out of Pakistan. The threat coming out of Pakistan vis-a-vis -vis terrorism is probably greater than any other place in the world, but I still think it is a threat that is much less than we have been led to believe by our political leaders. After all, there has been no attack in the last 10 years anywhere in the world nearly on the scale of 9-11. And that is significant, it seems to me, in terms of understanding the real magnitude of the terror threat. So it may be chronic, but it's not acute, and we've been acting as if it's chronically acute. Yeah, and if you look at the kind of al-Qaeda attacks, this is even before bin Laden, you see that they've been going like this. They're moving towards, they used to have 19 guys on 9-11, four planes. Now they basically have these one-off lone wolf fairly poorly trained people. Uh, and I think what you're seeing is this is a movement that has very little ideological appeal in the Arab world, and in fact, operationally, is significantly weaker than it was on 9-11. Also, not only, as you suggest, does this war on terror, has this war on terror really distorted and harmed Americans' perceptions of their own self-interest and their actions in the world. It's had really deleterious economic consequences internally. I mean, when you look at the fire departments in Muskogee, Oklahoma, getting massive amounts of anti-terror funds, you know this is pork barrel. This has nothing to do with making me safe. You and I walk around with bullseyes on our backs, mm -hmm. us in New York and you, you also in Washington, and billions of dollars are going to, excuse me, podunk, for, for pork. Yeah, well, we, after 9-11, we essentially created this kind of military homeland security industrial complex where basically all kinds of contractors saw there was huge amounts of money to be made here. Not to say we didn't need to beef up our homeland security right. to some degree, right. but the fundamental challenge to America's way of life is not losers like Al-Qaeda, who have an ideology that nobody in the, in the Middle East really wants to follow. It is the winners. We are being threatened by countries that are winning, that are succeeding including countries like Turkey that are, go that are having enormous economic growth, mm -hmm. that have reasonably democratic political systems, and are challenging America in terms of our way of life because they're learning how to compete economically. That, it seems to me, is the fundamental challenge for America. Okay, let's talk about Obama uh, as president, as leader, and the politics of 2012. M most generally, are there core principles in the Obama foreign policy, military policy? Is there some sort of nascent or explicit Obama doctrine here? I think the closest thing to an Obama doctrine has actually been this effort to rebalance American power, uh, American economic power with America's military commitments. You know, there is this idea that Walter Lippmann had called solvency, mm -hmm. which is essentially was to say, if you have more commitments overseas than you have power at home, you're insolvent. It's like mm -hmm. you run out of money in your bank account. Mm -hmm. You've got to balance the books. I think Obama, in a kind of halting way, is trying to do that, but I don't think he's going to be able to do that successfully until he starts to move towards withdrawal in Afghanistan.
But at, but the the Osama bin Laden killing is really double edged. On one in one sense, what it does is it says to a lot of folks, listen, we are number one, we are the best, we can exercise power, we can reach into a sovereign country and kill somebody we want. We're sending drone missiles against Al Qaeda's number two. So there, there there are always different lessons to be learned from history, and one of these lessons may be the exact opposite of what you might want and you're suggesting. Well, except I think if you look at the drone policy, that itself I think is symptomatic of where America is going. Remember what happened in Vietnam? When Richard Nixon started to withdraw ground troops because the American people would not sustain the loss of lives, he moved to fighting from the air. Right. Because it was and he cheaper. bombed Cambodia. And he, yeah, and he, because essentially, I think that's essentially where our policy, drones are air power 2.0, okay. and that's where our policy is headed in Afghanistan because it's, um, whether it's, whether it's good for the people of South Asia is a separate question, but it's cheaper and more sustainable. I think you're going to see a diminished U.S. ground presence, but you're going to see this continual drone presence to try to keep al-Qaeda off guard. Uh, reflecting again your analysis that the American public are unwilling to even put their, their men and women in danger. Yes, exactly. Okay. Now, uh, you did a piece on May 3rd, two days, I guess, after the announcement, and it says, Bin Laden killing a racist Democrat's wimp factor. Talk about that. Talk about leading from behind and Jimmy Carter. Well, the Democratic Party, ever since Vietnam and the Carter presidency, has labored from this perception that it's weak on national security. I, I think a lot of that, if you look at the facts of foreign policy, is incorrect. In fact, Democrats have started, for better or for worse, plenty of wars, including Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, Kosovo, a whole series of wars. But Grenada. Oh, that was that was Reagan, and, but yeah, wow, that's yeah, true. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, but I'm um, sorry. Uh, but you know, a lot of this is not about foreign policy. It's about the culture war. Foreign policy is in some ways an extension of the culture war. Once the military moved, the officer corps moved into the Republican Party, that created a cultural reality in which Democrats were seen as the anti-military party, uh, just as like they were seen as the anti-religion party. It's mm -hmm. also not, not really fair. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what Obama has done is very significant. The most significant thing politically any Democratic president has done since Vietnam to overturn this. because. This was the because, and it's partly the way he did it. it. It ran counter to all the stereotypes of the Democratic Party. He didn't go to the UN. He didn't consult a bunch of international lawyers. He did something pretty actually daring. He sent U.S. and risky on sovereign mean, soil. Risky. He didn't even send missiles, uh, uh, and and he succeeded in and a he very did it coolly in a very kind of macho in a very macho way. I think it it it. it I already already thought he was going to win fairly easily in 2012, but I think it, it helps him even that more. And if you look at the way Republicans have reacted, it's quite striking. I mean, I have, it is amazing to see how many prominent conservatives and Republicans have said, you know what, I take my hat off to the guy. I disagree with him about a lot of things, but he deserves a lot of credit. It's been a really quite remarkable thing to see. Now, does this allow him the, the slack, if you will, to have this more inward-looking, more rational military and foreign policy, or does it say, wow, I took this guy out, we could reach out there? Is that not necessarily the lesson he learns, but a lesson to be learned, that we can extend our power and reach in? For me, this is actually a, a Reagan-esque moment for Go Obama. Uh, because I actually think if you look, the fascinating thing to me about Reagan's foreign policy is Reagan, remember, he was a post-Vietnam president. He knew the American people didn't want anything like another Vietnam, but they wanted the psychic satisfaction of getting the bad guys. And Reagan was a master with things like the inv Grenada invasion, mm -hmm. of allowing right. Americans to feel tough and proud with at very low cost and low risk. In some ways, this bin Laden operation is the equivalent of Grenada, and I think it does give Obama uh, the space to, in fact, to start to withdraw from Afghanistan and to recognize that, in fact, we are not in a position in which we can launch more large-scale ground operations around the world. Well, and then Reagan, I mean, he, he takes the, you know, he becomes elected, and the Iranians release the hostage because he threatened to bomb them. So again, it was the threat of the use of power rather than the actual exercise of power that, that Reagan accomplished. Yeah, and Reagan was, Reagan was hap used air power like in, like in Libya, uh -huh. but he was very, very cautious about using ground troops. You know, Reagan's, Reagan, uh, at the end of Reagan's presidency, some conservatives want him to send troops to Panama. They said, we've right. got to invade, get rid of this guy, Norio. Right. Are you crazy? That's going to be another Vietnam. Right. Reagan was very, he sent 
sent the ground troops to the Marines to Beirut once they once there was a terrible rebound. He turned around and brought, brought them back up. Back. Uh, Reagan was very aware of the limits of the American public's willingness to, in fact, be engaged in sustained ground operations. And I think Obama is learning that lesson too. But uh, one could argue with the the, the Reagan Beirut ma mm. Marine situation, mm. where you have 240 some odd Americans killed, is that it showed the enemy, if you will, that you know you can't kill a couple, they run. That, that's right, and that's why actually conservatives have been critical. One of the few things conservatives ever criticized Reagan for is in fact for withdrawing in the face of terror in Beirut. But I think Reagan was in fact absolutely right. There was no way that U.S. Marines in Beirut could solve that country's internecine religious sectarian Unless conflict. Unless we didn't learn subsequently, that, certainly the that, second Bush. That's, that's, that's exactly right. And I think Reagan was actually a lot wiser than many of his conservative supporters. Okay. You wrote a piece that, you know, you're already bored with the 2012 election because Obama is a shoo-in. And this was before... The, the, you know, the assassination of bin Laden. How do you come off saying that? Well, first of all, I Are start... Are you laying money on this? Uh, I wouldn't lay a little bit of money on it. Okay. I, I think, I, you know, I start with the premise that the norm in our political system is for presidents to get reelected. If you look at presidents who lose reelection, the thing they almost always have in common is a significant primary challenge in their own party. Uh, you know, Ford having to run against Reagan in 76, Carter having to run against Kennedy, Kennedy. in 80, right. George H.W. Bush having to run against Buchanan in 92. Yeah. If you look at President, Obama's not going to have a primary no. challenge. There's no one in the Democratic Party. Does he but, need one? Uh, no. I think, in fact, if you don't have a primary challenge, it means you can have a united party. It means you can move to the center without sacrificing your base. Because remember, these primary challenges always come from the flank of your own right. party. So who was the, if you go back to presidents, who was the last president without a significant primary challenge to lose re-election? It was Hoover in 32. In fact, presidents who, have, who don't have primary challenges have a very, very strong track record of winning. Uh, and I think the Republican Party also is not in the position it needs to be to topple a sitting president. They're not hungry enough. Parties need to lose two or three times before they become hungry enough to do what it takes to appeal to the center. Republicans are not there. Oh, so, but they're hungry. I don't think they're hungry enough. I they're don't not know hungry enough. They're not hungry enough to challenge their own party's base when the party's base pushes them to take positions that are unpopular. And that party's base voters. is simply not enough, you would argue, to topple a sitting Look president. at the litmus test that the Republican Party has established. You can never have raised taxes. You can't be for stem cells. You can never have wavered at all on abortion or gay rights. You can't take climate change seriously. Reagan would not have been able to pass these litmus tests. These have been certainly not Barry Goldwater going back. No, I mean Reagan. Reagan was pro-choice early on. He was of pro-choice. He was he was pro-illegal. You know, he, he did an amnesty for illegal immigrants, particularly with Iowa. Um, there there has been, which is dominated by a hardcore of conservative, often socially conservative activists. There has been a series of litmus tests. Look at Mitt Romney, right? If Mitt Romney does win the Republican nomination, he will have to spend a lot of his time just trying to appease Rush Limbaugh because he will not have the conservative base in his pocket, which will make it harder for him to reach out to the center. I think Obama is in a structurally a much stronger position than they are. And, in fact, this, this assassination puts him even in a stronger sense in terms of the wimp factor. Because yeah. in, a can, in the campaign, you know, the leading from behind Jimmy Carter, that all went, that all went out the window on, on, all of that on stuff, Sunday, main, Sunday all, night. Yeah, all that stuff is much more vague and abstract than the reality that this guy got for uh, Osama bin Laden. That will be the dominant reality in American foreign policy in 2012, unless something else changes. Okay, one of the things that sort of, you know, raised my blood pressure just mm -hmm. a little bit was some of the European reaction to the Osama bin Laden killing. Mm. The, the Spanish prime minister mm. excoriated us and said that no good Democrat would have killed him and they had to put him on trial. I couldn't help but asking, how about the trial in Barcelona mm. to see if that would have changed his attitude? Mm. What has been the reaction generally of both elites, the media, and the mass, if you will, to this killing outside the United States? Well, you know, I mean, there's there's some there's some criticism, but I, I think in 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 general, I think it's pretty mild and, and pretty tepid. I mean, in an ideal world, um, had the U.S. had the ability to capture him and put him on trial, yeah, I think that would have been superior. But the reality is, given the political reality in the United States, it would have been a nightmare to try to do a trial for Osama bin Laden. And so you can hardly blame Barack Obama for not want, having wanted to go through that. No, yeah, okay. So uh, in a sense, 
the argument was that it was a kill or capture, but ultimately, irrespective of the actual intentions, the kill was better. Well, it was certainly better for it was certainly better for Obama. Again, I, I uh, was it better? Okay, wait a mm. second. Was it better for you and I, well, as New Yorkers or, or wa slash Washingtonians? It's a complicated question for me for this reason: if the United States had the capacity to put Bin Laden on trial and then lock him up for the rest of his life, I think that would actually showcase our our rule of law, our liberal democratic system at its best. I think the problem is that in reality, as a result of the hysteria post 9-11, we don't actually have the capacity to do that. I mean, and you saw this in the debate over the Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Right. right. And so, as a, I would, in my ideal world, I would like us to be able to do that, but I think I have to acknowledge, looking at the American political reality, that we didn't have the capacity to do that. It would have been an, a total mess. And so, in those circumstances, I bet when we finally get the last draft of history, of what happened in this raid. Well, after we're gone. I, I, I don't think anyone will be surprised to find, in fact, that the efforts at capture were fairly minimal. And everybody knew, whether they said so explicitly or not, that the best outcome from, from the United States government's point of view was exactly what happened. And maybe from the world's point of view as well. It, look, it, it, again, in an ideal world, I think it would have been preferable to, to put him on trial. Okay. But we don't live in an ideal right. world. And I'm not sure that the American political system had the capacity to, in fact, handle that. Thank you. Come, you're coming back next week. My thanks to Pina Beinert. Join the two of us next week as we discuss the Icarus Syndrome, a history of American hubris and American Jews and Israel, here on CUNY TV. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.